University of Melbourne, and I worked as a consultant, um, mostly in strategy and technology, first for IBM and then KPMG. So we kind of have a really nice mix already where it's kind of like she's the product and the industry and I'm the business. So the idea originally came from Sarah. So she spent 15 years working on a farm that rears and rehabilitates exotic birds. So if you have a $4,000 macaw parrot, very sadly, pass away and leave a chick, then the chick is potentially also worth $4,000 at some point. So they were trying to find ways to optimize the environment for it. And really that means mimicking what the mother would have given to the chick. So Sarah was rigging together hot water bottles and nests and feeding tubes to try and find a way to give this chick the best chance at life. But if you then look at the macaw parrot industry, while they're worth a lot individually, the industry as a whole is kind of pretty small. So she was saying, well, what else could we do with this idea? And you look at the poultry industry where, you know, Hazel Deans is the largest poultry processor in Victoria and they're processing about 600,000 birds a week. And so it's a bit more than you might get in macaw parrot sales. And this is one of the main things that you then learn in entrepreneurship is it's all very well to have an idea, but if you're not solving a problem, you're never gonna sell a product. So the Australian Productivity Commission released a report in 2005 that said, on average, farmers need to double productivity on their farm every 15 years to stay profitable. It's about a 4% improvement to your bottom line every year for 15 years, which is just it's pretty ridiculous. It's insanely huge as a target, especially when given the drought in the noughties, feed prices were increasing. The Coles Woolworths duopoly has kept the retail price of chicken meat static or effectively declining for five years. And all of the historic improvement, improvements that have come in the poultry industry are from feed and genetics, but both of those are plateauing. So we spoke to someone in the feed industry and at this point you can change the pellet size and color and beyond that, that's about as good as you're gonna get. So the next horizon of productivity improvement is from process improvement and environmental enrichment. So looking at the farm and saying, how can we do this better? Because you can try and put more birds in and you can try and give them more feed, but ultimately it's the whole environment on the farm that we need to look at. So we're building robot chickens. <laughs> and I'm really sorry to say that I got off the phone with my IP lawyer yesterday who said, if you show them a photo of your product, that counts as prior art announcement and you will void your patent application. So I'll talk you through it, but the rule of thumb, in case you ever are one, um, wondering or have to have the absolute pleasure of dealing with a patent attorney, <laughs> is you can talk about um, what it hens that look after baby chicks. At the moment, you can't put baby chicks with their hens for kind of three reasons. The first is biosecurity. You can't put adults that have fully formed immune systems in with chicks that are often pre-vaccinated because they often can't be vaccinated till five days. So if any hen brings in the tiniest thing, then you've lost your whole flock. The second thing is territorialism, and I don't want to cast aspersions on mothers more generally, but <laughs> hens are incredibly aggressive towards chicks that they don't recognize, so you often end up with <laughs> cannibalism. <laughs> the final thing is space. The way that commercial poultry farms work at the moment is you can often have the largest farms in Australia, kind of 60,000 birds in a shed. So if you've already got all of them, you just don't have the room for their mums as well. But that means that chicks miss out on really core developmental support. So we are trying to find ways to replicate some of those features. And if you kind of think about what a hen provides for a chick in your head, that's pretty much what our product does. It's kind of split into two areas. The first is creating a nice, dark, warm space for the chicks to move into and move out of and rest. 
and that has provided really interesting implications around socialization. So they tend to form better social bonds and also synchronization, so circadian rhythms. So the chicks sleep together and eat together and rest together. So we actually find that you end up with a much more peaked distribution of weight than you do normally because they're all kind of doing the same thing at the same time. And the second then is actually teaching chicks to eat and drink. Because chicks, I mean, we've got the term feather brain for a reason, right? They don't have a good link between their head and their stomach. So they'll often end up with a stomach full of sawdust and quite sadly die because they just don't know that that's not what they should be doing. So at the moment, um, farmers often put paper out on the ground and put feed on top of the paper. And just the sound of the chicks walking along it is enough to direct their attention and be like, ah, oh, I should eat this. But you can't put water out on paper on the ground, and then you can also end up with contamination. So we're trying to find ways to attract chicks' attention to feed and drink, particularly in that first like three days when they're still absorbing the yolk sacs, they don't necessarily need to eat. But if you can get them to eat and drink in that period of time, then you can have a huge impact, not only on mortality rate, but also on the chick's ability to grow in the long term because you've got them off to a really great start to begin with. So the idea originally came from Sarah's time and her experience, and that's really where all ideas come from. If you are looking around at your workplace and you think, oh, geez, like, why do we do this that way? Like, it doesn't make sense. So when I was at IBM, I did a job um, automating health IT, and we went to a hospital, and I won't tell you which hospital, but if you came in in a car crash or whatever to um, the ER and you needed a CT scan, then the triage nurse would get a piece of paper and stick X-ray or CT scan on the top and fill out your details and say that you need it. And then they'd get another piece of paper and they'd put the other one on the top and they'd fill out all your details. And then they'd hand that piece of paper to the orderly and the orderly would take that piece of paper and walk down from the ER to the radiology department and give it to the radiology nurse who'd say, oh yeah, high priority, I'll put you here on the timetable, and would give the orderly a piece of paper with a time on, and the orderly would walk it all the way back to the ER and give it to the triage nurse who'd say, okay, well, she's next. And then you get wheeled down to the radiology department and you rock up and you realize that you've been shuffled around on the timetable. So then you get walked back to the ER and it's just things like that where it's like, given we now have all this incredible technology that's just at our fingertips, why aren't we making the most of it? And the decrease in cost of some of this technology is exactly what makes robot chickens suddenly actually really feasible. So the idea has to then go somewhere. And I got a little bored as a consultant, believe it or not. Um, and I decided I would go back to uni. So I went and studied the Masters of Entrepreneurship at the University of Melbourne. And a lot of people really teased me about it. Can you really learn to be an entrepreneur? And oh, look, you probably can't learn how to have ideas, but you can learn how to test ideas and to really think about what kind of structure you need to put in your business to say, ah, oh, look, this is a feasible idea, but you know, who's actually gonna buy a robot chicken versus, oh yeah, you know what, I think we might actually have something here. So then the next step was we were very lucky to receive some seed funding. So, so far we've raised $100,000 and we have about eight left in the bank. Um, <laughs> but we're about to hopefully raise another 400,000, which will give Sarah and me and two engineers and a salesperson a job for a year. And hopefully in that time, we can actually really start to build a credible business. And you know, I'm really impressed that you are able to raise 20, 20 million. That's hopefully the plan for the future. But at the moment, you know, half a million will do us grandly. <laughs> and then we're also working with Milowa, who won best in class for their chook at the recent Australian Food Awards, as well as Hazel Deans to say, you know, let's transition this concept from an R&D innovation idea that works in a lab to making sure that it actually works in a farm. Because the decreases in mortality and the 5% improvement in feed use that we've seen in a lab may not actually be replicated on a farm. Fortunately, it looks like they are, which is great. But that then starts to be the base of how interested your customers are gonna be and how much you're gonna be able to sell your product for to them. And this kind of comes to 
what in the startup parlance, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, what we call the lean methodology, which says you can build the most amazing product, but if your customers don't want it, you ain't got shit. So what we have is we build the smallest thing, what we call an MVP or a minimum viable product. What's the smallest thing you can build? What's the smallest thing you can test? Sure, a hen provides all of these 12, 15 features of maternal care to a chick, but we don't have the ability or the time or the money to recreate all of them right now. So what's the top one or two or three that we can build that will still have the level of impact that will keep farmers interested and mean that we're not wasting their time, but we're providing something of value to them. And then you test it and you measure it and you learn from it and you ask them what they thought and you do it again. So, so far we've gone through five prototype iterations and each one, you change it a little bit and you change it a little bit and you change it a little bit. Because we're working with animals, it's really important that we're able to maximize the impact that we're having, positive impact, of course, and really try to make sure that we're articulating to our customers, no, we're not going to impact on your revenue, because it's a big risk for farmers to get involved in startups the size that we are, and we want to make sure that we're not putting their livelihood at risk, that if we're having the worst impact we can have is no impact and any impact that we have is a positive impact. And then you do it again and again and again and again. So far, we have three farmers on board that we're working with, and that's really exciting. So we've got one in Millerwood, which is up in northern Victoria near Beechworth. We've got one in um, Emerald, and we've got one in, in uh, Dalesford. And these are what we call our evangelists. These are the people that read an article or saw us speak and said, you know what, this is a really cool idea and these girls are trying to change something and I want to be involved in that. Not necessarily because I'll get money out of it, but because this is an idea that I believe in. And this is one of the things that is so important to a startup of the size and the stage that we're at is we don't have the ability, if, if Mr. Inghams called us tomorrow and said, can you please kit out all our sheds? We'd have to say no, because we just couldn't. But what we want is someone who says, well, look, I've got two 20,000 bird sheds. I'm only an hour out of Melbourne. Anytime you want to come down and take a look at the sheds, happy to. Next time I get chicks in, give me a two week heads up. Let me take a look at your product so that I can make a decision. And then you can whack it in and go through this build, measure, learn, test cycle again. We received $250,000 worth of seed funding from a group called Scale, who only invest in companies that have at least one female founder. And that was both an active and a passive decision on our side. I don't know whether you guys saw, but there's been a lot of discussion about sexual harassment in the venture capital industry. And Sarah and I are very lucky to have not been on the receiving end of any of that but that's because we were approached very early on by scale. So Sarah and I won the University of Melbourne end of year pitch night, which was amazing publicity. And actually the CEO of scale approached us after that and said, look, you girls are very early, but just go through the process. It'll be a great learning experience. And six months later, we got the money anyway. We've run through four prototype tri trials with real chicks to positive results. And we're in the process of patenting our idea, which We'll see how that goes. <laughs> so the challenges we face. Um, agriculture is going to be Australia's next $100 billion industry. It's huge. One of my favorite sayings is never to complain to a farmer with your mouth full. But farmers do it incredibly tough. And while we have all this amazing innovation in the cities, not enough of it gets expanded out to rural areas as you know, I'm sure I don't need to preach to the choir here. Act, but accessing customers is really hard. Millowa, uh, one of our main evangelists, is a three and a half hour drive out of Melbourne. So if you're gonna go and visit them, like that's a whole day. And the poultry industry, and don't get me on a rant because I am happy to talk poultry for hours at this point, the poultry industry's got a lot of really unfairly bad press, 
And so you can't Google poultry farmer because they're worried that Peter's going to come and knock down their door and put cameras up and try to catch them out. Whereas actually, I don't... Farming, I just think, is one of those really honest professions. You don't go into it to make money and, and be cruel to animals. So you can't just find poultry farmers on the street. And that's been a really huge challenge for us and one that we're overcoming by trying to go like slightly different ways, by contacting local MPs and local councils, um, trying to be on, say, ABC um, Gippsland, who I think we're here today for a bit, um, and to go through some alternate routes. So if you know any poultry farmers, please do come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> uh, the second is finding testing environments. Building an app isn't easy, but you also kind of just need a couple of laptops and a couple of guys in a garage somewhere. Building a hardware product that might have a heating component that still needs to be IP65 certified, which means it can be pressure hosed down. Like, imagine one of those like blow heaters you have in your living room being able to pressure hose down. It's, it's a kind of different beast. And trying to get it to that point is really hard. So finding places that don't mind you having a jigsaw in one hand and a soldering iron in the other while you're on the phone to some investor somewhere is, you know, a different thing. And that also comes to the expense of hardware and the time that it takes. It's, it's a long process. So Sarah and I actually had our year anniversary two days ago and um, Sarah's currently on a diet, so I bought her some flowers instead. But um, it, it is hard, but it also means that there's not been a lot of it done before. So the, the ideas that you can come up with and the opportunities that are out there, if you kind of think outside the box, are really interesting and really exciting. Because like, if you'd said a couple of years ago, I'm going to go and build some robot chickens, I probably would have laughed. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's not that hard. If you go down to JCAR, you can get um, just some little servo motors, and then you can get some little Arduino control boards, like some mini computers, and you hook them up, and before you know it, you've got a chicken head that can peck at the ground. And it's like, oh, that wasn't too hard. <laughs> so that means that there are these incredible opportunities and there is incredible support that you can get. And that then kind of ties into my final po point, which is, yeah, but will someone actually buy it? And that's the ongoing question that we have as a company. We don't have a finished product. We're not only what we call pre-revenue, we're also pre-product. And that's an ongoing process, but it's one of the exciting things about being in this space is you can kind of take people along for the ride and you can go and talk to farmers and say, well, actually, can I just spend a day on your farm and tell me what problems you're facing? And let's see if we can work together to try and fix some of them. And it might be a robot chicken, but it also might not be. <laughs> so we went up to one of these farms and we're like, oh, well, what's one of the biggest problems they had? And they go, oh, gee, well, I don't know if I kind of actually want to tell you this, but I'm going to anyway. We have meat birds, but we also have layer birds. And we have a piece of paper that we record the eggs that we receive from each of the sheds. And we lost one of those pieces of paper. So we got to the end of the month. We averaged out the number of eggs that each shed was producing. And we had one shed that was clearly underproducing, so we sent them off to be um, processed. <laughs> you know what? They found that piece of paper, and it was their best performing shed. So Sarah and I actually spent two days building them an app so that now they all go out with their smartphone, which you know everyone has anyway. They can enter the number straight into their smartphone and it pings up on the farm manager's web page and he can then actually see in real time how the chickens are going and at what point the breakages are and counting the eggs ahead of time and being able to forecast likely results based on the lifespan and, and what the chickens are up to. And that's just a really simple but tangible way of showing that sometimes you don't need big fixes, sometimes you don't even need robot chickens. But there are some ways that you can engage people like your early evangelists to fix problems that they may not have, in a different way that you, they may not have thought of. And that's one of the things I love about the ag tech space is you've got farmers with this incredible wealth of knowledge and experience and a job that is inherently entrepreneurial. And you're coming at it slightly sideways and saying, well, look, I don't know anything about crop rotation, but I can build you an app, and I can map out your farm processes, and I can point at places and say, 
yeah, but why do you do it that way? And maybe we can put in a robot chicken and we can improve your feed uptake by 5%. And if feed is 50% of your costs, then I've just wiped 2% off your bottom line in perpetuity. So the future. More testing, more farms, more iteration, more learning, more prototypes, more tests, more building. It's kind of bit the course of my life at the moment. But it's also transitioning from what's known as a proof of concept to what's known as a prototype to what actually you'd buy on the shelf as a product. And that's why having those early evangelists is so important because they kind of don't mind if you've stuck it together with gaffer tape and there's a bit of putty to make sure that it's all fine and odd wire hanging out because they can see your vision and they've bought into you as people and a business and a concept and an idea. And then you go and hire the engineer and the industrial designer that can translate it into a vision of something that can sit on a shelf and people can walk past and go, oh yeah, I'd buy one of those. But it's important to recognize it doesn't need to be at that stage yet. It's one of the things engineers are really bad at, but it's one of the things that you need to work on. And I can't remember who brought up the concept of tech debt, but that's really huge in hardware because you can kind of end up down these rabbit holes and sure, we're using what's known as a servo motor now, which is essentially little gears and it can move back and forth. So it can both wind and unwind. But it means that if it's constantly pecking and tapping and you're only using, you know, 15 degrees, then the gear within that range just gets totally shredded. So what's a different way we can think about it? And recognizing that there's many ways to skin a cat or a chicken maybe. Um, and you need to recognize that just because you have a problem that you're solving doesn't mean you have to be wedded to a single product because there's many solutions and then there's many products and it's a big tree and you just need to be willing to be flexible and to change and to say, sure, let's go down this path for now, but let's also be open to changing. Further investment needs, hardware's expensive, agriculture's expensive, getting out of Australia's expensive. So, you know, I think the next round that we might do and investment is a whole different discussion might be closer to 2 million. Um, and then we can partially get that supported by the Australian government um, because they have um, a uh, export grant. And that kind of ties into expanding nationally and internationally, which is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your time. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's been so technically interesting. So oh, it's awesome. I'm, absolutely. So, I'm part of something that's doing farm VR, which is taking virtual reality onto farms for shearing sheep and everything. Oh, and I think it would be very interesting. That's in so cool. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, that really interesting talk. Would anybody have uh, any questions for me? Don't tell me I've like, answered all your questions in my talk. Surely you must have some. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Sorry? Ladies first. Ladies first. Hi. So my question is, are you sick of robot chickens yet? Like, do you see yourself like, <laughs> so with this idea that you just, I want to do anything else with robot chickens? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. To be honest, I do. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very good at sticking with things. The longest job I've had so far is two and a half years. But that's also partly because past jobs I've had, you end up in quite a niche. Um, whereas in this job, you know, yesterday I was talking mostly to investors. Today I'm down here. Tomorrow I'm going to be up at a farm. There's just such a joy in the variety of problems that you're trying to solve because you're not just trying to solve the problem for the farmer. You're also trying to solve all your internal business problems, your cash flow, your marketing, your media strategy. So will I ever get sick of robot chickens? Well, possibly. Will I ever get sick of being an entrepreneur? <laughs> Which I still feel a bit weird calling mm -hmm. myself. I hope not. Did you have the question? Uh, yeah, thanks for your discussion. Um, I've got, uh, I'm just going to say it because I've been a farmer for probably 30, 40 years and done a whole lot of different stuff with livestock and, uh, and naturally suspicious at the start of your presentation. You know, Absolutely. Which is, um, you know, caution is uh, sometimes a good kind of business management risk strategy. But yeah. I couldn't say how delighted I was just to kind of listen to your thought process uh, throughout the presentation. Well, I wish you every ounce of luck 
Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> I, I guess that um, trying to construct a question in all this, but like the, yeah, no, sure. the whole kind of risk of this, um, this idea you've got, you know, like, the, and, and going to a farmer who's just got so many yeah. problems, you know, and, and I just don't understand how the, the focus that you can have, but, mm. but the, I can say that like the whole kind of mortality thing mm. is just so huge. Absolutely. So, do you want me to just kind it, of? How does it, what I want to know is, sure. does it actually work? Yes, right. yes, it does actually work. And, and so, the kind of how close do you really think you are before you've got that product? Because like, yep. th this is just one example. You've been there for a couple of years. Yep. You know, so, if I give you another problem, there's yep. plenty of them. Absolutely. You know, like, when are you going to move? You know, when, when, when have you got the space in your head to move on to the next one? It's a really great question. Um, one of the things about farming is most people, most farmers are small traders. So if you come and pitch to them a new piece of infrastructure, you're not just competing against their next tractor, you're competing against their next family holiday. So you need to have a pitch that says, look, we're going to create value for you that will pay itself back in two years. Like that's the kind of time period that you need to work on. But in part of that, you then need to recognize the problems that are creating um, financial burdens for them. So th one of the farmers that we dealt with is trying to fix the problem of getting chicks to drink in that first period of time by pushing out additional drinkers through the farm. And that's really hard, difficult for him because he then has to rake around them, he has to refill them, it takes up space in the shed, he needs to take mat, he needs to pressure hose them down and sanitize them for the next run. So it's not only a, a time labor burden for him that he's already trying to fix our problem, but with a manual solution. But it's also that the problem is enough for him that he's all farmers are interested in. And, you know, at what point will I expand beyond chickens? Well, we have the same problem in pigs. Do, does everyone here know what a sow stall is? Yes, no? Um, I see a couple of shakes. So. At the moment. That's awesome. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much, Eleanor. That was great. That was great. And I'm going to be around all day, so please just, if you have questions, please do just drop by. Thank you.